The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about them, Cowboys? Yeah! Go Cowboys! This is Girls Talk Boys Talk, presented by Jigsaw Dating, preferred dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys, and broadcasting live from Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star. Welcome in to Girls Talk, Boys Talk, brought to you by Jigsaw Dating. We are talking playoffs, folks. And normally, I think a lot of people would be excited about that heading into the postseason. Guys, I was in Washington for this one, and it was a very deflated, very quiet locker room. Uh, Clarence Hill and I were talking about it. Dak just seems stunned after. Haley, I know you talked to at least one player in the locker room. What was sort of their reasoning for the epic collapse, not on just one phase, but all three phases of the game. Yeah, I think they just went into this one kind of underestimating what that last game was going to look like. I think they really figured that their roster matched up better than Washington's roster. And at the end of the day, they were a little underprepared. And as a result, they got smacked in the mouth really early and just never really found that rhythm. They never really found that bounce back period. But what I will say is I remember being in the locker room after the Jacksonville game. And I mean, that loss probably hurt them more than any one of the season. You know, I think the Packers was very similar, but the Jacksonville one just felt like they were in a funk for a while. Whereas today, I felt like they were a lot more fresh. They were a lot more open to speaking. I know I spent a lot of time talking to uh, J. Ron Curse, who did as well. He had a lot of spring in his step, which is really important. I think he's become one of the big leaders on this team. So it was positive to know that they recognized that they didn't play their best ball. They identified why they hadn't played their best ball, and they're ready to put that in the past. And they feel really confident. I mean, J-Ron, even when I asked him, I said, where's your confidence level at after that game? And he goes, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of a way that I can put this in the best way. I'm trying to think of the best number, uh, but I can tell you it's over 100%. So, I mean, at the very least, they're feeling good. They're in a much better spirit. And, again, as he pointed out, as we've pointed out, they haven't lost back-to-back games this season, so that gives me a little bit of confidence as well. Yeah, Haley, he said, we didn't have a lot of time for woe is me. And that's true. And he also said that this is sort of an opportunity for everyone to reset. And I think all of us kind of do that, right? Even we just did a lot of that a lot of at the New Year. It doesn't really mean much that it turned from 2022 to 2023, but sometimes you sort of need a mental reset to say – Today and moving forward is going to be different. So let's hope that's what the Cowboys do. But before we dive in, let's talk about the daunting task of overcoming and drawing a team like Tom Brady. That's why I thought trying to improve their seating was so important because I think it would have been better if they'd gone through the other bracket, right? Because then you would have avoided going through Tom Brady. Tom Brady is 7-0 in his career against the Cowboys. We've talked a lot about that uh, this week leading up to the game. Most wins without a loss by any QB versus the Cowboys all time. Brady has never played the Cowboys in the postseason, but he's 3-0 against uh, Dak Prescott in his career. And this was another crazy little stat that we had earlier. Tom Brady, since 2000, has 11 times more playoff appearances than the Cowboys. He has more playoff – he has as many playoff appearances, 35 – as the Cowboys in their entire franchise history. So this is a guy that knows what the postseason looks like, how to win in the postseason. Uh, But, you know, we've been talking about this is a different Tom Brady uh, this season. He's actually logging worst ever in a lot of statistical categories. I just still, this is a guy I don't think you you overestimate, underestimate. Uh, I think more importantly for the Cowboys, and I think they talked about this a little bit today, Mike McCarthy, This game is going to come down to less about trying to beat Tom Brady and more about not beating themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Every week. (laughs) That's the reality every week. We've been saying that every week. Yeah. And and I feel like they beat themselves with the same mistakes. You have the mental focus, the pre-snap penalties. Of course, I bring that up, right? But you also have just... It seems like the miscues and the miscommunication is something I always go back to, but it shows when they're all confused. And schematically, nobody knows what's going on. Guys are missing their routes. Nobody knows what they're doing. It's just so obvious when they are in their own heads and beating themselves. But, yeah, I mean, this is a – what's interesting is is I started to deep dive into Tom Brady because specifically throughout this season, because it's very easy to get caught up in the historic Tom Brady. Like you said, though, Jane, this is the first time he's going into the postseason with a losing record in his career. So 
I got a little curious because all we keep hearing about is how this isn't the same Tom Brady. Well, why is that? I started deep diving into all 18 weeks of the season for the Bucks. The only trend I've noticed is this Bucks team will score in the second half of these games. So fourth quarter specifically. Fourth quarter. And the first time that they score a touchdown in the game in the second half, that was eight games, five of which that they won. Um, they scored a, the first touchdown in seven games this season against any opponent, one being against the Cowboys. But they scored first four times that they've won. So this is going to be a game of who can score first. And specifically, I'm not talking about kickers because their kicker, he has had a season. He has been put to work uh, time and time again. But I'm saying you have to score touchdowns in this game. You have to be active in the red zone. You have to make sure that if you're the Cowboys and you get that possession first or when, whenever you get your first drive, you are scoring that touchdown because that is going to start to help you slay that Tom Brady dragon early on. So you're saying 10 three and outs in a game is not what the Cowboys are <laughs> aiming for against Tom Brady? <laughs> Please, no. no. You, you brought up the point about them. Um, well, I've really been looking like to you. I've been looking at their offense and just how different it was. It is from – even at the beginning of the year, but mm -hmm. really um, when they can play the Cowboys because they run, they can run the ball. Their offensive line, just like the Cowboys, has taken a lot of hits, and um, I know they possibly are going to be getting some guys back here soon, but it's really their inability to take to run the ball puts a lot of pressure on their offense to have to pass. So coming into this game, I really feel like that's, that's what they're going to intend to do, and even so, even with their passing, they're going to try to do intermediate stuff. They're trying to get the ball out of his hand quickly because throwing downfield is just not – the most conducive because you don't want him getting lit up. So uh, <laughs> him don't like that. Um, so uh, that's that's really what is different to me with this offense specifically now from the last time you played them is that they ran the ball very easily for the most part and um, and you couldn't. Sorry, I mean that sounded terrible, didn't it? Barnacles. <laughs> but yeah, no, like this is very dramatic. Oh yeah, no, it wasn't meant to be dramatic. But no, you couldn't run the ball, and, and well, you didn't run the ball mm -hmm. because Ezekiel Elliott ran the ball fairly decently last. I watched it last night, and I was like, oh. And then it was just passing the ball, passing the ball, and yeah. then their linebackers told you they knew the plays, and you could tell that well, their defense knew what was going on. I talked about this on our show earlier. To your point about the run game, they want to establish the run. They want to be a run first game, but they want to be able to run efficiently. Mm -hmm. And when you start seeing them move away from the run game, it's because they're not being able to do it efficiently, and they're not being able to do it efficiently lately because of some of the offensive line shifts. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we're watching the game, we're not really looking closely at Check. why things are collapsing, why the pocket's collapsing, why yeah. the run game's not getting going. And as was explained to me, not having Tyler Biotish there really is a problem because it's not just Tyler Biotish. When you've got to pull Tyler Biotish out of the game, you're putting Connor McGovern in a position that he doesn't play that much. Then you're moving Jason Peters to a position that he's barely played the season. And then you're asking your rookie to kick out, you know, kick inside rather to left guard while Peters goes to left tackle. And mm -hmm. so three different guys that are typically not on that line. It's their fourth offensive line combination this season. It creates a problem for communication. And then what they're noticing across the line is these last-minute defensive line shifts. So they're showing you a look like, oh, I'm going to rush through the B-gap or the A-gap, and then they're quickly changing it. And that offensive line and the runners can't adjust in time. And apparently that's been a problem a lot this season with some of the injuries. But I was told Tampa is particularly good at doing a defensive line shift at the last second. Mm. And then the linebackers for Washington were running right at the, run back, the, the running backs – I was told the problem when you're dealing with Tampa Bay is these guys are really physical. They're really aggressive. So if you are aggressive as a running back, you're going to get beat on some swim move. They'll swim move on you. Mm -hmm. And so that they're saying, you know, the message to the running backs this week is be patient. Mm -hmm. Have a good base underneath you. Anchor. Make sure you're – it's all about the fundamentals. And I, yeah. I think all of us kind of think it's kind of a throwaway when they talk about it. Simplify. Get back to the fundamentals. But – when they've lost games, like the Packers game, we talked about their response. Remember, it was after that. We just got to get back to the fundamentals. And then they, they bounced back, right? <laughs> so did, yeah. yeah. And so I, it's a possibility to do it here because for the reasons we've talked about, Tom Brady is a bit of a boogeyman as it relates to the Cowboys, but he's also doing things he's never done before this season, things that have been uncharacteristic of him. And we were even kicking around on Media Mash 
this might be one of the worst teams that Tom Brady oh, has fielded. Oh, Sorry. yeah. And especially when you're talking in terms of the O-line and the struggles they've faced this season. Because what's interesting enough is this is going to be a game of O-line against O-line, really, when you look at it. Specifically in that center position. Because the Bucks are also struggling with their center. And what does that lead back to? That leads back to the miscommunication that you've seen even on the Cowboys side of the ball. So if you want to relate anything to that, Tyler Biotish was great with the communication. And that factor alone, taking that away that showed in the Washington game, but the Bucks are dealing with the same thing. I mean, Robert Hainsey also had an injury that uh, Todd Bowles is being very mischievous about, and that also brought up the question for Ryan Jensen. Is he coming back? There's been a lot of speculation. What's going to happen with that? Can he come off of IR? He has to by the end of the week. So you're either going to be facing Ryan Jensen, who is coming out of this IR situation, being expected to take all of these snaps in a full workload, or you're going to be facing a third string center for the Bucks, which they don't really have other options. So to me, when I look at this whole game, it's going to come down to O-line and O-line specifically, which center can communicate more and help the offense as a whole. All right, well, let's go ahead and take our first break. When we come back, we talked a little bit at some of the offensive line woes. Let's talk about some of the defensive challenges because in the last five games, we are not seeing pressure up front. And what you need to do with Tom Brady is make sure that he's feeling pressure in the pocket. So this is the week to do it, uh, Cowboys players. Uh, This is Girls Talk, Boys Talk, brought to you by Jigsaw Dating, the official dating app of the Dallas Cowboys. We'll be right back. At Jigsaw Dating, we obviously want the Cowboys to bring that sixth ring home. But to be honest, we're more focused on finding the person who will put a ring on your finger. That's why we created a dating app that reveals your face through meaningful conversation, so you can date deeper. Because it's personality that matters the most, not looks. Join Jigsaw Dating today, dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. All right, Pepsi-loving football fans, it's time we had a lesson in trash talk. And I'm not talking about that stuff that happens on the field. What I'm talking about is trash, and it's the only thing that belongs in your garbage can. Now, recycling might not be as thrilling as converting a fourth and long, but next time you're thinking about throwing that Pepsi Zero Sugar bottle away, just cap it back up and pretend you're down by six with the recycling bin wide open. (sighs) Know the difference? Make a difference. Be a team player and recycle. Visit PepsiTrashTalk.com to learn more. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap it to Prescott, who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With Blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at Blockchain.com. Welcome back to Girls Talk, Boys Talk, brought to you by Jigsaw Dating, the official dating app of the Dallas Cowboys. But first, Dak Prescott and your Dallas Cowboys are heading to Tampa Bay to take on Tom Brady and the Buccaneers in the wild card round of the 2022 NFL playoffs. Come out to the Miller Lighthouse at AT AT&T Stadium for a free wild card watch party on Monday, January 16th. Cheer on the boys alongside the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders and Rowdy while enjoying lawn games, food trucks, and much more. Gates open at 530 and kickoff is at 715 p.m. So for more information, visit DallasCowboys.com slash 2022 playoffs. All right, guys. Well, we were sort of giving – nobody wants to hear excuses, right? There's plenty of teams uh, that are in the postseason that have had to overcome a number of injuries to their starters and certain players, and they've done so admirably. The Cowboys have had a number of injuries this season, specifically to key starting positions. And look at them. They're still 12-5 and five, heading into the playoffs to face uh, Tom Brady and hopefully survive in advance. But as much as we talked about the offensive line and some of their struggles defensively, we've seen a lot of rotating on the defensive line, particularly uh, the interior defensive lineman. And as is as explained to me, I said, why aren't we seeing more pressure on the quarterback lately? And I was told they're not cohesively rushing as a unit. And some of that is because of some of this interior uh, line change. And some of that is on the one hand, you're finding out who you've got and what they've got before you get into the playoffs. Okay, so you're, Dan Quinn's doing a little bit of a sample size there, right? The other issue is you've had injuries, right? 
But as it was described to me is when you've got these two interior defensive linemen pushing the unit and you're not rushing as a unit cohesively, you should be getting three to five steps. That's what these guys should be doing. And what you're doing is you are you are collapsing the pocket around the quarterback, getting pressure to them instead of giving them time. And so that's why in recent weeks we've seen Josh Dobbs and Sam Howell look so good is they got a lot of time back there in the pocket. In fact, in the last five games, the Cowboys are giving up 10 more points a game. And I think they, they're they averaging 2.8 less sacks. And so I think that when you've got a guy like Tom Brady, this is the week you need the pass rush to step up. Um, this is a guy who is going to hurt you uh, with his arm. And so I just thought that that was really, really interesting. We, we talked about the fact that Jonathan Hankins is going to come back. That's going to be huge, I think, specifically when you consider you've got Leonard Fournette, who Leonard Fournette has not have a, had a huge season. But when he's had moments, he's had moments and taken advantage. Correct. And I think it's also key that you're getting Leighton Van Der Esch back, right? And so they have been missing key pieces, and we'll get into the cornerback position here in a little bit. But when we're just talking about that sort of front seven, that's been one of the areas of concern. Aisha, I know you look at a lot of the tape. What are you seeing when you look at that defensive front and some of the struggles that they've had in recent weeks? No, you mentioned it. You hit it on the head. We talked about it earlier this week. With the rotations, sometimes you have with Dan Quinn trying to figure out what he has and what he doesn't have. He's been um, playing guys. Some of the gentlemen you see playing DT, some of them are better pass rushing. Some of them are better, you know, actually two gapping or whatever. And you, so when he's doing these mixes and stuff, you have some guys doing things that they're not accustomed to doing or doing well. So with the injuries, you have to have guys fill in. Also, too, you have to think about the amount of reps that guys are getting that they typically maybe wouldn't have been getting before. So I'm looking at, obviously, with them getting healthier, them having more uh, flexibility there. But Mike McCarthy mentioned um, – just how important Leighton Van Der Esch is to this defense. And he said something that totally I totally forgot about is that he is the green dot. And when that when he put in that put that in perspective for me, I thought about the fact he was like Malik Hooker and J. Ron Curse have had to, you know, take the green dot. And when you look at even what's going on with the secondary, the idea of Leighton being able to come in and man the front seven and the secondary being able to just be quarterbacked kind of as a unit again mm-hmm. and not having to worry those guys having to worry about what's going down in the box I feel like that could also you know you know I guess pivot the conversation from how the defense is going to be defending the run and stuff because so. it's tricky when you've got guys in the secondary that are having to come up front yeah. set your your defense and then run Eric Weddle used to do it a lot for the Ravens mm-hmm. I remember talking to him about that they don't have a lot of guys doing that for a reason yeah and J. Ron Kirst did a great job of it but I think Mike McCarthy talked about you know, Leighton Vanderesh had a great season. I remember when they were sort of playing with Jalen Smith wearing the green dot, and then mm-hmm. they would send it back to Leighton Vanderesh. But Leighton does seem to have a really good handle on this group. I think J. Rod Kirst did a great job, but I think it allows the flexibility. Because I was asking Mike McCarthy, I wasn't looking at it from from that viewpoint. I was thinking it was just freeing up Micah Parsons exactly. to be able to have a little bit more freedom and flexibility to play him on the ball or off the ball. I didn't even think about how it allows – some flexibility and, uh, you know, allowing guys like J. Ron Curse and Malik Hooker to focus on their assignment as to, and versus getting the guys set. Yeah, absolutely. And just even with Malik just having, you know, obviously with the cornerback two stuff, I know we're gonna, just him being able to help out there and not have to worry about helping out in the box. But also, too, the cornerbacks, um, these young quarterbacks, Deron Bland, Nishan Wright, those guys – um, coming up and tackling and run support, I think, is going to continue to help you, especially with Hankins coming back and the, that size being there. It's going to allow your linebackers to be free and your DBs to re- be free and really try to contain these edges, which is what they got to do in this game because Leonard tore them up mm-hmm. last time. Yep. Yeah, I think it'll be nice just to get that sense of normalcy back. Yes, I think ma'am. that's really what's been missing over the last five weeks. You <laughs> mentioned the offensive line being in four different combinations so far this season. I think that speaks to the defensive side of the ball as well. They've had to make a lot of adjustments, and I've said this for weeks now. You never know what you have until it's gone. Yeah. And now I How think— How much do you appreciate some of these guys? Yeah, Leighton yeah. Vandress, Tyler Biotish, like these Anthony guys. Anthony Brown. Brown. Yep. Bunk, yeah, so Jordan I, Terrence Still. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I think just from a mental standpoint with these players, I think, you know, the schematics, the details of it, they've had it. It's just been difficult because they've been moving around, jumping from place to place, trying to adjust or, or maintain, if you will. So I think not only do you get your leader back in Leighton Van Der Esch, but you just get that sense of normalcy, that comfortability back. And then you can kind of get, you know, the question of, well, this is this defense still elite? Now you kind of see when it was elite, why it was. And yeah. now you get that back and you get an opportunity. I think you mix in the motivation factor of last year's playoff that they – 
talk about, but not so much talk about. You know, you get the motivation of starting the season with the Bucks, and now they get to start the playoffs with the Bucks. I think there's just a lot of factors that go in that help from a confidence standpoint as well. Oh, yeah, and that confidence is going to be more than important because you were just talking about it, Aisha, and I'm, I'm giggling as I'm reading my notes because I swear sometimes we have the same exact things. Uh, Leonard Fournette, week one against the Cowboys. That was his best game, his only 100-yard rushing game of the season. And... <laughs> You know, it's interesting when you, you see kind of how this Cowboys defense has to operate. They just have to go back to the basics. And you just said that, Jane. It sounds easy, right? But you have to collapse that pocket. Get in Tom Brady's face. Because you've seen time and time again, when he has that pressure on him, that's when he is, you know, kind of on Tom Brady-like. That you've He gets seen, very frustrated. You've seen it more this season than I think you've ever seen in his career. And that's what people need to play on. That's what the Cowboys need to play on is – get him frustrated, and get in his face early. I, and um, what I really like to credit Demarcus uh, Lawrence for is he puts his hands up and bats the yes. ball down. And putting your hand in his face is going to be so important because the more you can do to mentally distract him and physically get in there, that is your key to starting early. Score first, get in Tom Brady's face, and again, yes, rush the edges, but also you have to collapse the pocket at all points and you got to key in on that center position. You have to key in on that because right now, either way, I mean, I'm not saying Ryan Jensen's not a great player. He is. I will absolutely give him that credit. But when he's coming off fresh, and we've seen how Mike McCarthy handles a ramp-up phase, there's a reason for that because expecting a player to come in and play all of these snaps all at once, you're not going to see the same player that you saw pre-injury. So, again, play on the weaknesses and the defense that D-line needs to do their job, get in the trenches, be physical, be quick because – Tom Brady is going to try to expose that cornerback to situation very quickly. That's where I was going with this. Uh, I feel for Dan Quinn because I feel like he's throwing – there was a – I had to laugh. It was a, a meme on the internet, and it was a brick wall, and it was just throwing, you know what, at the wall to see if anything would stick. And that's what's felt like the cornerback position. I mean, so many people trashed Anthony Brown, and so mm -hmm. many people trashed yep. Jordan Lewis. I got to put my hand up. There were times that I was critical of their play – I think what was key is they were so good about the eye discipline, right? We've talked about that in a couple of weeks. I think that's still what some of these young guys are struggling with. I caught up with Sean Wright. He says he feels like he's playing better, and he is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the addition of Xavier Rhodes, which I got to get right. I keep saying Xavier Woods, who was here in 2017. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But Xavier Rhodes, you know, Jerry Jones alluded to it on 105.3 The Fan that we were going to see more of him. Mm -hmm. He got sort of acclimated over the weekend. They didn't have a real practice today, so they'll see more tomorrow. But now, Sean said, it, not dissimilar from seeing T.Y. Hilton in the wide receivers room and Jason Peters on the offensive line, Anthony Barr, you know, with even some of the linebackers, having a guy like Xavier Woods, who remember it was like all roads closed when he played for the Vikings. They, he just talked about his handle of the defense, his ability to talk to them. I think it helps. And I think that's it's a young team. And I think that's it's that's been great for them because I've covered teams where it was one of the oldest locker rooms in the league. But I think in some rooms they've been missing sort of that veteran presence. And so I love that they've been able to get some of these guys off the street to come in and help fortify that area. So I think you're going to see Xavier Woods playing a lot, especially because he's got postseason experience. J.K. told me today that he was uh, teammates with Rhodes yep. up in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, what do you know about him? Like, how good is he going to do? Because we saw Trayvon Mullen's audition and, and maybe we it need to good. look at <laughs> yeah. some other auditions. And that's my favorite thing about J. Ron is like I can go up to him, like keep it straight. And he's going to keep it straight with me. And I said, you know, obviously, like he's new. He's still learning. But like what it, how do you feel about him coming in? He said, that's my boy. Like I have no <laughs> doubt that he's going to come in and make an immediate impact. And so, again, it just goes back to that confidence standpoint that you have mm -hmm. I, I I think when you have a young team it's tricky because this is the first time that a lot of these guys are doing these things you know this will be the first time some of these young guys have played in the postseason Deron Bland, this is the first time Nation that they right. played really played against a Tom Brady against a Bucks team that's been successful in the playoffs since 2020 when Tom Brady joined the team and so you may not see you know all of the snaps go to Rhodes in this game but you at least can feel confident knowing that you're getting a guy in here who's been there before, who can come in and provide some relief when Nishan Wright maybe isn't has missed or, or kind of like we talked about yesterday, there's that confidence level mm -hmm. of, you know, like if he's not going to settle in correctly or whatever it is. Now you have Xavier Rhodes, a guy that not only the coaching staff feels comfortable about, but the guys on the field also feel good having him come into. And what I like about having that veteran presence is the ability to diagnose things quickly, because I think that's been a very big issue for uh, the defense as a 
a whole. And that showed when Leighton was gone, specifically with that safety position. Woo, that was that was rough. But I think having Xavier helps diagnose things quicker and and again gives those younger guys like um, Nation Wright the ability to work with somebody who can help them accelerate that skill set a little bit more too because that's so important is being able to read things quickly and diagnose it and act on it and you know not take that sidestep that puts you off for one second and then the play's gone. So I think that'll help a lot too. Well, we're going to take our second and final break here, but when we come back, uh, ladies, I want to ask you this. What concerns you more? As we start talking about the coaching carousel, you know, it was obviously Black Monday and a lot of positions to fill uh, this offseason in the NFL. Both Dan Quinn, Kellen Moore, getting opportunities to go interview for head coaching jobs. Who concerns you more, the loss of Dan Quinn or Kellen Moore? Fans will ask you to think about it and perhaps weigh in here. We'll have that and more on Girls Talk, Boys Talk, brought to you by Jigsaw Dating, the official dating app of the Dallas Cowboys. At Jigsaw Dating, we obviously want the Cowboys to bring that sixth ring home. But to be honest, we're more focused on finding the person who will put a ring on your finger. That's why we created a dating app that reveals your face through meaningful conversation so you can date deeper. Because it's personality that matters the most, not looks. Join Jigsaw Dating today, dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. All right, Pepsi-loving football fans, it's time we had a lesson in trash talk. And I'm not talking about that stuff that happens on the field. What I'm talking about is trash, and it's the only thing that belongs in your garbage can. Now, recycling might not be as thrilling as converting a fourth and long, but next time you're thinking about throwing that Pepsi Zero Sugar bottle away, just cap it back up and pretend you're down by six with the recycling bin wide open. <sighs> know the difference? Make a difference. Be a team player and recycle. Visit PepsiTrashTalk.com to learn more. It's Smoothie King's original Angel Food and New Angel Food Slim without added sugar. You no longer have to choose between treating yourself and hitting your goals this summer. You don't have to choose between great taste and feeling great. Because at Smoothie King, every blend is made with whole fruits and no syrups, so you can satisfy your cravings without compromise. The only choice you will need to make is which one is best for you. Try our classic angel food or the new angel food slim, blended without added sugar. Smoothie King, rule the day. Welcome back to Girls Talk, Boys Talk, brought to you by Jigsaw Dating, the official dating app of the Dallas Cowboys. But first... Just steps away from the Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters in Frisco, visit the Star District, your destination for excellent dining, premier shopping, and excellent events. Visit thestar.com for more information on what there is here at the Star. All right, ahead of the break, I pose the question to you ladies. What concerns you more as we start talking about Coaches getting opportunities to go and interview for head coaching positions, which I believe is January, when is it? Right after the playoffs is when they can start having these conversations. So when you look at Dan Quinn, Kellen Moore, Dan Quinn uh, obviously rumored to have interest, I think, what once again with the Broncos. Mm -hmm. I think maybe they should have probably hired him last time instead of Nathaniel Hackett, although I think a lot of people thought maybe Hackett could get Rodgers there. You've also got Kellen Moore uh, that's, that's been asked to go talk in Carolina. Who concerns you the most next season? And this is just a hypothetical. What concerns you the most, the loss of Dan Quinn or the loss of Kellen Moore? Who wants to go first? I think Dan. And I think Dan, not just from what he does on the field when it comes to, I mean, we joked about it earlier with like just throwing everything, including the kitchen sink to get the job done. But (laughs) when you think about how coaches can impact players I think if you were to go into that locker room and you were to pull the defense and you were to ask them that question, uh, they would tell you how much Dan means to them. I've been talking about J.K. all day because I spent a good chunk of my time talking to him. But that's there one of the things many players that, available. By yeah, the way, <laughs> that's one thing that he said today. They, you know, he was asked that, like, if you, if Dan were to leave, what would that mean to you? And he literally said, "When I'm done playing, when this is all said and done, Dan Quinn is going to be a guy who I remember, who I can mm-hmm. attest." my career too and to me that speaks louder than anything Dan has done on the field because you know and they say it all the time like coaches don't do this for the money they don't do this for you know the impact on the field it's building leaders off the field I think that's one of the Cowboys six that Mike McCarthy always talks about and I just think that 
the reason why this defense has been so successful, why it's been so resilient this year, is because of the impact and the leadership that he provides. Not to say that Kellen doesn't provide that same leadership, but unfortunately, I think Kellen has a tendency to be very coaches speak, very to the point, very just this guy. I don't know how well he is connecting with his players in the way that Dan Quinn connects with his players. And I think that's why people are so interested in him being a head coach, because he can provide, even when he was with the Falcons, he was providing that as well. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I think when people think of of Kellen Moore, for instance, a Carolina team, I think they're hoping they can find a Kevin O'Connell or mm. a Sean McVay or one of those guys. But I, I'm with you. When I, when I listen to the guys talk about Kellen Moore, it's with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of love for him. and But that love stems from him being a guy that was in the room with them. Yeah. Right? Like, don't forget that Dak's first year, these two were in the quarterback's room together. And so, <laughs> Which is and so, so weird to think. I, I was going to say. <laughs> and so Z Zeke speaks of him highly in that way, too. But I what stood out to me was last year uh, in OTAs, right when Dan Quinn had gotten here, unprompted the way these players would talk about Dan Quinn. And obviously it was like night and day from Mike Nolan to DQ. But even today I caught up with, uh, to your point, Stefan Diggs, uh, Stefan Diggs, Trayvon Diggs, man, I'm having a day, ladies. <laughs> Trayvon good. Diggs and uh, J. Ron Curse. And what J. Ron Curse said, uh, piggybacking off what you said, he said he's brought a brotherhood to this locker room. Mm -hmm. And I said, is he a hugger? Is he a texture? He said he's both. <laughs> And so that's the sort of stuff I think that really resonates with a lot of guys. But more importantly, also says the way he believes in me. People can say they believe in you, but he goes, but then he shows that to me. And I think that's huge, right? Because when I think of, and I'll talk to both of you ladies, I didn't play sports in high school. I mean, I played on the B team in golf, but I don't know if my <laughs> computer lit teacher qualifies as a motivating coach. But when you look at your coaches over the years, Haley, what was the coach that stood out to you and why? I think the coach that stood out to me most, oof, let me think, I would probably have to say one of my assistant coaches at North Texas, Daniel Dobson, only because I was a grad transfer there. I feel like when you're a grad transfer, it's different because you're so much older and you know, you're know you just kind of there because you have eligibility left usually, especially in a sport like soccer. Uh, but Daniel really made me feel like a part of the team, like instantly, you know what I mean? I think he believed in me because UNT, uh, for those of you who don't know, like the, the soccer program at UNT is the best program at the school. And that's not even me saying that because I played on it. John Hedlund has been there for 30 years and has yet to have a losing season. I think he's up to like 19 or 20 conference championships in three different conferences. So uh, it's a competitive program. And, you know, like you don't just get playing time just because you're older. Um, so from the very beginning, like he was very adamant about, you know, letting me know, like, keep working, like you're new, like just keep getting your minutes and then eventually worked my way into the lineup. And even still, he was very uh, helpful in that regard. But I think that's why I have that attachment to Dan Quinn and that relationship, because it does make a difference. You know, it does matter because, you know, you're sure you're coaching football players, but they're people, too. And we always yeah. say that on this, like people. And when you can tap into that people mentality it makes such a difference and and that's the way you latch on because now you know if I have a relationship with you now I have an interest in you helping me because I can understand that you care about what I want to do and how I want to grow and what I want to be and I can recognize that you want to help me get there yeah I, I think when I look in that aspect too I had a high school dance coach named Nicole Gomez and interestingly enough, her husband uh, is a he works for the Rams in, in some way. He's one of the one of the Rams coaches. But, um, you know, talking about the people aspect of it, it's also it, it has nothing to do with the sport at, at some point. It's there are the times I remember with Nicole or, or times I was crying and, and having a bad day. And she knew without even me having to say a word. It, it was, you know, me on that level because you care to know me on that level. And that pushed me on days I didn't want to be at practice or days I didn't want to go and push myself to the to the fullest to be like, OK, well, I have to do it for Nicole, at least if there was nothing else to fall back on. It was I need to do it for that person. And so I think when you look at the relationship that Dan Quinn has compared to Kellen Moore with these guys, it's more of a family aspect. And instead of the the you're my friend kind of situation, it's more of a I, I see Dan Quinn as an uncle 
more than you know Kellen Moore, who's who's like a brother, which is is a weird comparison. It's actually but, not a bad analogy. But it's it's you have a different respect in that matter. So when I think of you know my uncle, I'll talk to him very differently than I talk to my brother, and it's I feel like that is kind of the comparison you have with them. And I think for Dan Quinn. Not only, you know, last year you you saw the success he had with the defense and at the end of the season it was, oh, can he mirror that? Can he can he do that again? Yeah, and he did even better this season. There was better numbers than there was, you know, his his first year. And I think something too that's very imperative to remember as far as the defense is they're very young. This is a young defense that's very impressionable. So having Dan Quinn here for the long haul and, you know, moving forward is you get that Dan Quinn stamp on it. Kellen Moore's offense and the offense right now, it's an older offense. You don't you you have a couple young guys, but for the most part, those guys are set in what they're set in. They're gonna play like they play already. That defense is very moldable and very shiftable right now. So that's what kind of worries me about losing Dan Quinn. That's a good point. Um another thing about Dan Quinn, I remember when they first hired him, I was on it. I was immediately like, yes. Because I understood like what he when he imme- when he got hired, what he was capable of, but I also noticed that there's connection through these locker rooms, like through the locker room, like George Edwards, he brought in, I'm sure he had a you know part in bringing in J. Ron Curse. And, 100%. and even, even some of the guys that were drafted here, there's ties to well, all the was, Viking guys. Think about it. Anthony yeah. Barr yeah. and uh, Savior Rhodes. Yeah, but even like even with some of the conversations with the draft, there's some guys that were like, yeah, I met him in high school. Like mm-hmm. on this roster right now that knew him even before this time here. So when guys gather and you come play for you and really are like, I want to come play in that program. We also, too, we've seen him kind of in some ways revamp some guys' um, careers. You know, like we said, we, we ragged on Anthony Brown all that time. But, I mean, I felt like his play improved just because of the level of coaching and the staff that they brought in, you know, behind him. But in regard to the question, um, I had a drill sergeant, my first drill sergeant. Um, her name was Drill Sergeant Pullen. Um, she's from Miami. Hey. Uh, she was no joke. Um, <laughs> and one thing that I see in Dan, Ken- Dan Quinn that I see- saw in her was that she was not afraid to get out there and do it with you. And sometimes she would do it better than you. And I was a really big into PT, physically fit and stuff, but she was fit. She was a purple heart. And she would outrun us. She would outdo everything with us. And when I would see her doing that, I wanted to compete. I wanted to compete. Mm-hmm. And that's something that this locker room has thrived off of. So um, when you see DQ doing bull in the ring and his yeah. Nikes, the backwards hat. Yeah, the backwards hat. The backwards everything. hat, putting on the helmet yeah. just to show people, show the players how you're going to be getting chipped. Those are the... When you when your superior or whoever is okay with getting dirty with you and getting out there and showing you how it was done, you automatically gain a different respect for them. And that's something she did with me, and it made me. I felt I, I know it made me a better soldier because I wanted to be better than even what she was, and she expected that. He tried to make Mike McCarthy better in the off season, right? Like yeah. he said he had put on some some weight because of the stress that comes with the job. He had him in the boxing, you know, <laughs> boxing in the off season. <laughs> I'm with you, ladies, and and where I find myself. And this is not to discredit what Kellen Moore has done here as an OC because, I mean, it's one of the top scoring offenses in the league the last two years, right? But I find myself wondering when I look at Dan Quinn, and and again, no disrespect to Georgia Edwards or Joe Witt, who could be guys. I, I, I don't see them going outside. But I do wonder if Dan would take any of his guys with him uh, going somewhere else. But if if George was here or if it was Joe Witt, and and I would submit, I don't know Joe as well as I know the reputation of George Edwards. It was Harrison Smith who, when I asked him at Pro Bowl a couple years ago when Dan Quinn was coming, or George Edwards was coming here, he was like, oh, my gosh, they're getting a great, like, the, the, the adoration for George Edwards was off the chart. And even when Mike Nolan was struggling with that locker room, Mike McCarthy's first year, it was rumored that George was going to get promoted because the guys really sort of looked to him. But I find myself wondering if these guys are going to be as motivated with a George Edwards or a Joe as we've seen with a Dan Quinn. And so when I start looking at that, and then I I think to myself, okay, well, who would they bring in for OC? I mean, there's guys that you can bring in from OC. And by the way, Mike McCarthy can also call plays. I mean, Mm -hmm. he did it in Green Bay. He said he didn't do it here because he found that it, it was, was better over over the years to delegate, right? Yeah. So I don't know what that dynamic would look like, but I do know that Jerry at least is worried enough about it that we all know while the, no one got a hold of the contract, there was something done for Dan Quinn to make him stay here in Dallas so that he wouldn't go to the Broncos last season. 
Yeah, he has a. I mean, you saw his input on the draft. You saw like what he's what he's capable. Of. I feel like these last couple of drafts, especially, have been you know successful, and he just has a plan. Like that 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 was what was really dope about him too. Is like when he first got hired. I remember him coming in. I could be mistaken, but OTA rookie minicamp, a hundred attendance. If mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, it was you could see just that. I mean, little we typically stuff. see that Tracking around that. here in Dallas, Tracking but that. I think more importantly, it's the guys he's gotten off the street to come and play for Dallas. I mean, think how important guys like Malik Hooker, mm-hmm. J. Ron Curse have been. I mean, even Tack McKinley. A lot of these guys came here because of Dan Quinn. Yeah, yeah, and also, I mean. You have to have a certain presence to you. And there's just some people in this world that they walk in a room and they have a presence and you feel it and you can see it. Dan Quinn doesn't demand presence. He's not the kind of guy that's, look at me, do what I say. He walks in and, hey, guys, how are you doing? Before any press conference, that's the first thing he asks, even just reporters. How are you doing? How are you feeling? And it's just this automatic respect you get from even talking to him one time. I mean... Uh, I always go back to this Leighton Van Der Esch interview that I saw um, during training camp where he was talking about somebody asked him, you know, how did you know Dan was the guy? He said, I talked to him for 15 minutes and I knew. And sometimes people just have that presence to them. And Dan Quinn is one of those guys that just has that factor. All right. So final question. And we've got three minutes to cover this before we wrap this one up. Uh, When we look at this game ahead on Monday, what area is most concerning to you? when it comes to beating Tampa and advancing. Why did you look at me? <laughs> I don't know. It just it stressed me out a little bit. Yeah, I, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, I don't know if it's so much of a concern. For me, it's a question mark. I asked Mike McCarthy this today where Michael Gallup has been. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm very interested to see just how the wide receiver room kind of figures itself out a little bit. I mean, I think CD... We've talked about how he's been finding his groove. I think that's great. I think T.Y. Hilton coming in has been beneficial. But Michael Gallup's targets over the week in relation to his receptions and what he's been able to accomplish on the field has just been, like, piss poor, to be blank. And so I'm interested to see, you know, how they work him in. Mike told us today, yeah, he's a super important part of our lineup. He's a super important part of our offense. And so I'm curious to see how they address that and if it really is important. I was saying this on Media Mash. If you don't follow Brian Baldinger, who works at my network, uh, Baldy's Breakdowns, he did. We've been talking about Dax interceptions this season, right? And, you know, chemistry with his receivers. But there was some concerning stuff on tape against Washington. Now, they've got a really dynamic front seven, great defense. We talked about that heading into the game. But Michael Gallup's ability to get open was concerning at times. And and also Dax seeing guys that are open yeah, and moving away from them. Yeah. And either taking a sack or throwing the ball away was concerning. So oh, yeah. that's interesting. I'm still, for me, it's the cornerback position. Yeah. I just, I think Tom Brady is going to exploit that all day long. And so I think that's an area that I think is very, very concerning. And and if I might add, special teams, you don't want to start the game off with one of those muff punts like you did. Because <laughs> what I felt like was the Cowboys it's sort of if you, you knock them in, in the mouth early, they were struggling to get past some of the adversity of that on the road at least. We've seen them come back from it at home, but on the road, on grass, that's going to be tough. It was also twice in a row. Yeah. yeah. It was also, yeah. I mean, like there's there's coming back from stuff and then it's like, come on. You know, like that's that's something different. But I guess my concern, I'm, I'm not even going to say concern. That's stressing me out. Um, <laughs> what I'm looking for in this game is the offensive line play. Mm. Uh, just because it's just it's just pivotal to what you do. Is you want to be able to run the ball well. And um, I think that's just going to make the difference in this game, as it does all the time when your quarterback is forced to pass the ball a whole bunch because you can't do anything on first and second down. Yeah, for me, it's, yeah. it's I think, yeah. again, not the most concerning, but something I want to see – be more productive during this game is a better way to put it is what they do on first and second down and you segue you segue that so good for me um I swear we we talk way too much outside of this we're on the same length um but first and second down plays I don't want to see any more short runs by Zeke I I'm just it's the predictability factor Mm -hmm. I I need the play calling for this game to be less predictable and go back to what works because again Maybe yeah, not running those, on first down. Those, yeah, and or second, and, and you know that's what happens every single well, time. And and I talk, I have talked to people about that. You know, the they 
in order for the running backs to have an efficient game, you want to get them going early. So that's right. why you sort of feed them early and get them into a rhythm. The problem is when that offensive line's not sure. creating some of those holes for you and you're sort of running up against a wall, that's when they move away from it. And yeah. then that's where you're also getting Dak into some trouble where he's throwing some of those picks. So yeah. everything is – it's like the hip bone's connected to the knee bone yeah. and all of those things. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, you're not wrong on that. It's going to be – I'll be interested to see the game that Kellen calls, and yeah. I'm going to be really interested to see how Dan calls the defensive side of the ball against Tom Brady. I will be headed to Tampa on Saturday for a four-day run. Sounds so Very fun. disappointed that the weather is ridiculous. Iguanas are going to be falling from Ew. the trees this weekend. Be careful. Wait, what? She Saturday, told, told Saturday a high of 54, a low of 36. Game time is going to, it's going to be great football weather on Monday, 73 of a high, low of 50. But on Sunday game day morning, high of 63, low of 43. If you see me wearing a winter jacket in a brown, Tampa. A brown. A brown. Trolled for that. Jacket. But if you see football. me wearing a puff for jacket on Sunday. Mind your business because it is cold in Tampa. Let's hope that this is a cold game for Dak Prescott, uh, that he shuts down the Tampa Bay Bucks. So I guess what I want to say there is it's a hot game for him. Pray Saints. But yes, but a, but a cold, cold win for him. Hopefully we're talking about that on Monday, but you guys still have another show tomorrow. Looking forward to tuning into that one. Uh, thanks for tuning in, folks. This is Girls Talk, Boys Talk. Brought to you by Jigsaw Dating, the official dating app for the Dallas Cowboys. Another plug for our sponsor. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?